Okay. Oh, the worship team is here. Wonderful. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. How do you say Happy New Year in uh, Spanish? Hi, okay. Feliz San Año. Ah, Feliz Año. Once more. Ah, okay. Feliz Año Nuevo. Oh, that's so cool. Feliz Año Nuevo. Okay, and then <laughs> how do you say uh, Happy New Year in uh, <laughs> Tagalog? Bigayang. <laughs> okay. Maligayang Balong Seo. Okay, all right. And then and we have our visitors from uh, Singapore. Uh, China, or is, is it Chinese Mandarin? Or Singlish? Mandarin? English. Okay. Uh, how do you say it in, in Mandarin? How do you say Happy New Year in Mandarin? The easy form, the easy way. Singen. Singen. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Where? Where? Bueno. <laughs> How do you say Happy New Year in Italian? Bon anno. Oh, bo oh, bon anno. Feliz anno nuevo. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're not done. We got one more. We got one more. We got uh, Japanese. <laughs> uh, text. Uh, no. <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> um, and then uh, Japanese, uh, you all should know this. Okay, shinnen akemashite omedetou gozaimasu. But you just, that's too long. So you just say akemashite omedetou. Alright, akemashite omedetou. Ready? One, two, three. Akemashite omedetou. Happy New Year. Wonderful. Alright, let's go to our New Year's uh, scripture in, chap in uh, Luke, the book of Luke. We're in chapter 24. Uh, normally I have you go to either your pew Bible or your uh, bulletin, uh, but the bulletin version is different from your pew Bible, and we want to stick with the, the, the pew Bible. So in your pew Bible, it's Luke chapter 24. If there's no pew Bible, somebody did, oh yeah, just grab one next to you somewhere. Luke chapter 24, and uh, we'll go ahead and read from verse, 27, verse 27, Luke 24, verse 27. Uh, that's going to be in, in the NIV uh, 1984. NIV 1984. And uh, while you're turning there, a little bit of a background. Uh, uh, in this scripture, uh, Jesus has risen from the dead. He was murdered on the cross, and then uh, he was buried. After three days, uh, he rose from the dead, and he was seen by women and a few other disciples. And this is that morning uh, after he has risen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick up the story uh, of on resurrection morning. This is not an Easter sermon. This is a New Year's sermon, but it happens on Easter Sunday. Uh, the reason why is, uh, well, I'll, I'll, we'll get into it, but the main reason is I want to explain what we're going to be studying in our Bibles this year. The, <clears throat> the, the subject of our scripture today is Jesus in our Bible. Jesus in our Bible. So what happens is, Jesus is, excuse me, he's alive and he's risen. There's two disciples. Uh, one we don't know the name of. The other we know the name. His name is Cleopas. Uh, quite possibly his relative from other scriptures that we see, but we don't know that. And it turns out they're walking to, excuse me, from Jerusalem uh, to another city, to another town called Emmaus. They basically... The distance from downtown to here, if you can imagine that, they're walking from downtown Hiroshima to the distance of about Mitaki. There's two disciples, and they're walking along the road, and who shows up? The resurrected Jesus. But they don't recognize him. They don't understand it's him. 
even though they've walked with him, they've talked with him, they've listened to him uh, preach, they've eaten with him, they've slept beside him for three plus years now, it's, it's a new Jesus. It's a resurrected Christ. And so they don't recognize him. And so here they are, they're walking along and, oh boy, what a, what a crazy week. can't believe Jesus is dead. It would have been great if he was the Messiah. It would have been great if he was the one to set us free and, and make Israel a, a new country. And I wish there was some kind of resurrection. I wish he were alive. And here comes Jesus. Walk, he just walks up next to them. He says, hey, guys, what are you talking about? And they say to him, what? Where have you been? There was a guy named Jesus. He was great. He was mighty. He did all kinds of great things. And then he was crucified on the cross a few days ago. And it's been a few days. The tomb is empty. We don't know what's going on. There are some women friends of ours. They, saw, they said they saw him, but we, we can't believe them because there's no resurrection. Haven't you been around? Where, you know, don't you know these things? And he says, oh, yeah, okay, I see, I see. And then this is where he picks up with them. So we're going to read uh, Luke 24. Verse 27, and uh, we're going to stop at verse 32. Luke 24, verse 27, we're going to stop at verse 20, 32. Okay? Let's read. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. 29. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. 32. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Okay, we'll stop there. I want you to picture this situation. Jesus is alive. Now, just imagine... You have been given your life back. Maybe you had a disease, you're pronounced dead in one month, and then miraculously you had your life back. What's the first thing you would do? Where would you go? Who would you meet? What are those first things? That would tell you what your priorities are, what your pleasures are, uh, what's the number one thing in your life. But what did Jesus do the first time he got up from the grave? He taught the Bible. He met with his friends, and he showed them what the Bible is all about. And he explained to them what's in their Bible. And what is in their Bible is all about him. Can you understand this? His disciples heard him speak three years plus, walked with him, heard him preach the Bible day and night, saw him healing people, helping people, feeding people, and they still didn't understand that he could raise from the dead. So he had to explain it to them. What you read from Genesis all the way to Malachi is not about a God who is vengeful and angry and will punish the world if they don't believe in him. You're not reading about some God who's far away, who, who gave you Ten Commandments and left them there for you. You're not reading about uh, some nice stories of people who fought giants or people swallowed by big fish and that's nice. You're not reading about that. Everything, every story, every prophecy, every character, Every moral teaching, every commandment, every law, every regular, it's all about me. 
That's what Jesus is saying. Don't you understand that? And here's what he does. This is the coolest thing. He says, I'm going to start. Let's start with Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Or in the beginning, God created them as well. That's about me. And he goes through the whole thing, all the way through Malachi, which I read yesterday. Finished my one-year Bible program. Malachi. There's a prophecy in there. I'll tell you about that later. It's all about me. And he goes through the whole Bible. And you read the Bible, you'll see that it's all about me. God wrote a magnificent book. Over 40 different authors. 66 books. Books. It's not just one book, it's a collection of books. It's like a library. Over thousands of years. And it's all about one story. It's about how God came to earth to rescue people, to save their lives. That's the story of the Bible. And if you read it for any other reason than that, you're never going to understand it. It's going to be a mystery to you. You can open the Bible for how many years? And you'll see David fighting Goliath. You'll see Jonah swallowed by the fish. You'll see Moses getting the Ten Commandments. And you'll have no idea what it's about unless you understand it's all about Jesus. That's what he taught them. And so uh, 2012, I love how I can preach the first day of the year. And, and this year, I want you to hear from God. I want you to know that God speaks to you. I want you to know that God has words for your life to change you and to help you, to make you grow for not just this world, but for the next world to come. And you need to hear his voice. You need to understand what he's saying to you. And you're never going to understand until you learn how to read your Bible. And so that's what I want to do this year, is teach you how to do it, just like Jesus did. Now, just, just think about this. Jesus is explaining the whole Bible to them as they're walking on the road. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? I mean, just to walk with, with Jesus, and he's saying, all of this is about me, every story, every command. And you just wonder, why didn't God advance technology up to that point so that they could have at least a tape recorder or an MP3 recorder so that they can tape Jesus what he's teaching them, right? Or why couldn't God wait to send Jesus until now when they have MP3 players and an MP3 recorder? Why didn't he do that? And now we don't have it. We don't know what he said. We don't know what he taught to his disciples, right? Well, not so much. Actually, we do. It's called the New Testament. And for those 40 days that Jesus was alive on earth after his resurrection, he taught his disciples, he gave them his teachings, and that's what we have in the New Testament, how Jesus connected all of the Old Testament to him. And not only do we have the New Testament, but we have what Jesus calls the Counselor, the Spirit of Truth, John chapter 16. He's in us. He's guiding us to lead us to all truth, to help us understand. So we have something better than MP3 files. We have something better than tape recorders and videos. We have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus himself, leading us and guiding us into all truth. Uh, so that's what Jesus did uh, on, the way, on the road to Emmaus. How did he do it? Um, or excuse me, not what, excuse me, what, now why. Why did he do it? I want you to look uh, at verse, just one verse. Okay. Verse 32, the one we ended on. Verse 32. This is the two disciples after he disappears. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Were not our hearts burning within us? Do you have something that's burning within you? Do you go to work? Do you wake up in the morning and you know this is what God has me here for? This is why I am alive. And not just for the workers, but for, for everyone who goes to school, for everyone who does, uh, raises a family, for everyone who has a family, for everyone. Do you understand that you need to have a fire in your heart that consumes you, 
like a bush that's being that's just consumed all ablaze with purpose and with passion and yet is not consumed but continues to burn. That's what you are supposed to be. Your hearts are to burn within you. And we wake up in Japan. Oh, Japan. It's a, it's a country without purpose. And I've been here long enough to know that. It's, it's trains that go around in circles going nowhere. They're on time and they're filled with people. But they're just going in circles and the people in them are just going in circles. There's no fire in their belly. And they think, well, I just got to you know, provide for my family. I, I, I got I to gotta just survive. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be naked. I don't want to be hungry. And that's it. That's the land we live in. And Jesus came to teach us the scriptures so that we don't go around in circles, cold, in the dark, alone, but to have a fire burning within us that has purpose, not for this world, but for the one to come. That's what he was doing. And that's why he opened their eyes. And that's why he taught the scriptures. That's why the scriptures are so important. Because when you encounter the scriptures, and you see Jesus in those pages, and he's speaking to you, a fire kindles. There's a famous preacher, John Wesley, he says, every day, in the morning, I set myself on fire. And throughout my day, I let people watch me burn. That's the purpose of my life. And I want us to be a, a people that burn for him, a people that, that live for him. And how do we do that? It's in, it's in the scriptures. It's seeing Jesus in the scriptures. We're going to, this whole year, uh, hopefully all the way through December, I'll preach all the way through Malachi, the Old Testament. And I want you to see Jesus in your Bible. Jesus in the Old Testament. It never says his name, but his name is there. You're going to see it. And what happens in... I just want to show you something real cool. Uh, I've been on a, a one-year uh, Bible reading plan that I downloaded from the Internet for the past two years. Uh, I just read through the Bible every day. About three chapters in the Old Testament, uh, two chapters in the, or excuse me, one chapter in the New Testament. Let's see if I can find it. Are you all following me on the screen up there? Okay. Uh, where did I get it? Uh, it's not up there. Zanen, zanen. Uh, excuse me. Anyway, uh, I modified this reading schedule. And I made a one-year reading schedule for the Bible where you read it chronologically. So all of the events in the Old Testament, that ha you read them in the order that they happened. So when this king was alive, uh, and then it doesn't go to the next king until you read about the same king in the same... Anyway, it's chronological. It's really cool. And then, also, uh, during the Easter week, you'll read uh, all the scriptures that relate to Easter. And then during the... the Christmas week, or excuse me, Christmas season, starting in uh, December, you'll read the scriptures that relate to the birth of Jesus. And this was my idea because I, I wanted to do that uh, throughout the year. And then uh, every seven days, you get to read a psalm, uh, three psalms and a proverbs or a wisdom literature. And so you go on throughout the week, Old Testament, New Testament, every day. And then on the seventh day, sometimes Sunday, sometimes not, you'll read... Um, some psalms and some wisdom literature, and uh, it's just it's it's an original plan from Mitaki, which is really cool, and we've got it on our homepage. So if you want to start, you want to join in, uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, all the way through the year, and you can log on to uh, Mitaki uh, GC .com and you'll see there's an English and there's a Japanese as well, and it starts today. Today it started in uh, Psalm one through three. And then John chapter 1, tomorrow you'll start with Genesis chapter 1 all the way to the end of the, to the year. So uh, maybe that would be good for you to do. Um, but getting back, here's the thing. that uh, My goal for us to, for this year in reading our Old Testament is that you look at every nook and cranny of your Bible, of your Old Testament, and you find Jesus. You find him. 
You search for him and you find him because he's there. It's dripping. Every chapter in that Old Testament is dripping with Jesus Christ. And here's, what, here's why. Here's why this is so important. When you find Jesus Christ in every nook and cranny of your Old Testament Bible, here's what's going to happen. Because I, I know I speak from experience. You're going to find Jesus in every nook and cranny and corner of your life. You read a story in the Old Testament. You read a command, and there's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. And you learn to see through his eyes. And you look, and you live your daily life, and look across the table, sitting across the table from you. It's Jesus. You go to work. On your way to work, you hear somebody. It's Jesus talking to you. You look at something on TV, a situation, a news story, uh, some, something going on, and you find Jesus speaking to you in that situation. Jesus comes alive, and there's a burning in your heart that gets kindled. And you see Jesus everywhere, and you live for Jesus because you see him in your Bible. That's why, why Jesus was doing this. Now, how did he do this? This is my last point. Uh, verse 31. Verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. Just take a note there. Their eyes were opened, and, he rec- and they recognized him. I want you to skip down. Go ahead, keep looking at your Bible, and skip down to, uh, excuse me, verse 44, verse 44 and verse 45. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Old Testament. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds. He opened their minds. He opened their minds. minds. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to preach. You're going to read your Bibles. You're going to study. But it's not me doing the work. He opens your minds. He opens your eyes. We sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. It's Jesus who opens our eyes. And for those of us here who have been in Christ, who are Christians and we think we know Jesus, He's opening our eyes every day. And what we need to do is repent of our blindness. And we need to cry out to Jesus, Jesus, open my eyes every day. Open my eyes every day. And I want you to think also of your non-Christian friends, family, people who don't believe in him. It's not you who opens their eyes. They're not stupid. They're blind. And Jesus needs to open their eyes. And so this year could be that year. Don't lose hope. This year could be that year that Jesus opens the eyes. Uh, We're going to meet with my my in-laws, my wife's family, tomorrow for our New Year's. And, man, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking for it. There could be tomorrow where they ask a question or they see us doing something different. Um, Just recently, um, Nahomi's mom, or my mother-in-law, gave us um, an omamori for the birth of our, our third child. And she knows I'm a pastor. She knows we're Christians. And she just said, anyways, here you go. She got on the sly, undercover. And she slipped it to my wife. And I looked at it, and I opened it. And there's a little prayer for our third kid inside this little omamori. And we're, we're just like, Lord, what do we do? What, what do we do with this? Because we don't believe in it. And we don't, we don't want it in our house. We've got a cross in our house. That's the power. Um, and so how do we relate to our in-laws? How do we interact with this culture, our neighborhood? And so we pray, Jesus, give us a, a wisdom. Tell us how to talk to our neighbors. Teach us how to interact with our, our in-laws in a way that will not insult them and say, well, we're Christians. We don't need that. We're fine. You know, we, we don't want, we're not like that. We don't need that because Jesus was not like that with us. Jesus took us in and explained to us. He taught us. 
He opened our eyes. So we're like, Jesus, what should we do? And we prayed about it, we prayed about it, and said, okay, well, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll humbly and we'll quietly, we'll respectfully uh, find an opportunity to slip it back <laughs> and give it back to them, but explain it to them. Because we're not just going to, we don't want them to open their bag and, oh, there's the, there it is. But we want to explain to them and communicate our heart to them. And so uh, Naomi had this one chance, uh, I think last week, or two weeks ago, and she said, um, thank you, Mom, and we, I know you love us and you support us, but um, uh, we don't believe in this, and, but we, we love you, and we thank you for thinking about us, remember us, but our, our strength and our, our support comes from our God, Jesus. And how did she react? She said, yeah, okay, I, I kind of knew that, I understood, but I won't do it anymore. And she took back the Omomori, and, and it's smooth, it's all good. Right? Um, and so Jesus did, does that with us. He opens our eyes. He, he does it, he loves to do it gently, patiently, kindly. And so that's our prayer this year, is that he would open our eyes as we go to the scriptures. And I'm, exci- I'm so excited to read our new Old Testament and open up Moses, how Moses looks at Jesus, how Moses points to Jesus. David, in the story of David and Goliath, points to Jesus. How Jonah points to Jesus. How the Ten Commandments points to Jesus. How David and the Psalms point to Jesus. How the prophecies all point to Jesus. I just read yesterday, Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. God says, I'm going to send a Savior and he, um, before him, I'm going to send my messenger to his temple. He says, I'm going to send my messenger to the temple. Who's the messenger? Well, John chapter 1, I read it this morning, my first chapter. John, the Baptist, is the messenger. And it's, he looks at Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it's Isaiah saying that he is the one who goes before him to prepare the way. The messenger is John the Baptist. But also in Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1, it says he's going to go into the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. When was the temple there? All the way up until A.D. 70. That means the messenger, John the Baptist, would have to be alive before A.D. 70 because the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. If you go to Jerusalem now, no temple. And so Malachi, 400 years before the birth of Jesus, predicts the one who would go before Jesus and when he would appear. He he points to Jesus. God wrote this wonderful book, and everything about it is Jesus. We're going to go to Genesis. Pastor Hiroshi, here's what Pastor Hiroshi is going to do. He's going to preach the Old Testament this whole year. And so I'm going to take every, every text that he teaches... And we're going to teach it in this, in this service. And we're going to see how it points to Jesus. Next, year, next week, he's going to talk about Adam in the garden, Genesis chapter 3. And what does um, Romans talk about and 1 Corinthians talk about? There's the Adam, the first Adam, our father, who gave birth to us. And Jesus is the last Adam, who gives birth to us spiritually. Our first father, Adam, sinned in the garden, disobeying God. Our last father, Jesus, was in the garden, and he, he defeated sin by obeying the Father. Okay? Our first Adam passed on sin to us, and so all of us are, are guilty before God. Our last Adam, our, our last uh, father, Jesus, second Adam, passed on righteousness to us. It's all Jesus. All oh, Jesus. I'm so excited. I, I think you are too, but you're just not showing it. That's okay. Okay, so that's how he does it. Jesus opens our eyes. I pray he opens your eyes too.